Hello and welcome to part two of this drafting and interpreting financial statements mock walkthrough. In this video, I'll be covering tasks three and four, which are the first two of three written questions within this exam, and not surprisingly, the lowest performing tasks on the paper according to the data released directly from AAT. Before we make a start, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background information on these two tasks. Now, the key weaknesses for students losing marks in both of these tasks is actually pretty similar based upon the feedback provided from the examiners. So the main reasons on task three are not including enough points for the number of marks available and not answering what the question is actually asking, including making a lot of points that have nothing to do with what the question is asking. Both of these, although coming from slightly different angles, actually suggest that the reason is due to a lack of knowledge. It's either been a case of writing not enough because you simply don't know enough about what's been asked or not knowing enough and going for the approach of I'll write absolutely everything I've ever learned in accounts in the hope of scraping a couple of extra marks. Now, it's worth noting on task four in particular, the areas that students have been struggling with have been listed a little more usefully. So the key areas to focus on for this task are IFRS 16, which is leases and IAS 10, which is events after the reporting period, which we'll actually be touching on in this video. So with that in mind, let's swap over to the mock and make a start. So then task three is worth eight marks and is the first of three written tasks for this exam. And it's about reporting frameworks. And basically this one will contain something to do with the conceptual framework. So some typical examples will be defining assets, liabilities, equity, or income and expenditure. It could talk about share capital, share premium, limited companies, whether that be private or public. It could also talk about the fundamental or enhancing characteristics. So basically anything to do with the conceptual framework. So let's have a look at part A. So explain the objective of general purpose financial reporting based on the IFRS conceptual framework. So this is for four marks. And effectively, let's think about what your financial reporting is for. And there are a couple of main reasons what financial reporting is for and who it is for. So really, financial reporting is for a couple of key reasons, and that is to be able to provide financial information so that people can make informed decisions. So all we need to do is get that into our answer. Obviously, it'll need a little bit extra detail than that to get you full four marks. But let's start putting an answer together and we'll see how we get on. So the first thing I do is reword the question. It's just a nice way to start and it shows the examiner that you've actually read the question in the first place. So I'll start off with something like the general purpose of financial reporting based on the IFRS conceptual framework is to provide existing and potential, if I could spell, existing and potential investors with useful information that they can make informed decisions on. So we've explained what one of the main purposes of financial reporting is there. Let's now go into what would be included within the financial reports. So the financial performance of the business will be shown by the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. And should include all the business's income and expenditure. financial stability 
or position of the business will be shown in the statement of financial position. And should contain all the businesses, assets, liabilities, and equity. Any movement in equity will then be shown in the statement of changes in equity. Okay, so by doing that, we've explained what the purposes of financial reporting. So we've said that it's for existing and potential investors to be able to make informed decisions. We've also said what would be included in each of the financial reports, and that's the statutory financial report, so statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, and the statement of financial position, along with the statement of changes in equity. So it's only four marks this, so we don't need to write absolutely loads. That should cover us from different angles to make sure that we pick up maximum marks. So the next one then, part B, identify two characteristics of ordinary share capital. So let's think about share capital. So share capital is included within the equity section of our statement of financial position. It shows how much the owners have invested within the business. And depending on the proportion and the type of shares that they own, it also shows the shareholders voting capability. And also in terms of percentages, it would also make a difference to the dividends that were paid to each shareholder. So we only need two characteristics here. So it's entirely up to you which two you go with. However, I would go for just the simplest really. So share capital is contained within the statement of financial position. Under the equity section. I would then say that shareholders receive dividends based upon the number of shares they own within the company. Okay, so nice easy on that one. Two characteristics, one mark for each. Nothing to overcomplicate. So then moving down to part C, identify whether each of the following qualitative characteristics of useful information is a fundamental characteristic or an enhancing characteristic based on the IFRS conceptual framework. So we've got two here, we've got verifiability and relevance. So there are only two fundamental characteristics and there are four enhancing characteristics. So our fundamental characteristics are relevance and faithful representation and our enhancing characteristics being timeliness, verifiability, comparability and understandability. All of these should be within your textbook, so I'm not going to go into detail about what each one is. However, for this question, it would mean that verifiability is an enhancing characteristic and relevance is a fundamental characteristic. So that finishes off task three. So it's only a short one, that one. We can now move on to task four. So task four is worth 12 marks and is the second out of three written questions. And this one is about international accounting standards. So it will be anything to do with IAS and IFRS. So this task contains parts A through to D. The inventories of Woody Limited, a manufacturer of children's clothing, include a line of Parker coats at the accounting year end. The following information is relevant. So we've got costs incurred to date for the Parker coats. We've then got estimated cost to complete and estimated selling price. It also states underneath just here that selling costs are estimated at £700. Part A, I. Calculate the amount at which the inventory of Parker Coach should be recognised in the financial statements. 
for two marks. So remember our inventory under IIS2 needs to be valued at the lower of cost and net realizable value. A net realizable value is calculated as the selling price less any cost to sell and any cost to put the item into a sellable condition. So in this scenario, we've got costs of £12,000 and we have an estimated selling price of £14,000. We then have costs to complete of 3000 and selling costs of 700 So to calculate the amount at which the inventory should be recognised, we do the estimated selling price of 14,000 minus the estimated costs to complete of 3,000 minus the selling costs of 700 pounds to give you a net realizable value of 10,300 pounds. That is your net realizable value. So bear in mind under IS2, we've said that inventory must be valued at the lower of cost or net realizable value, and your cost is 12,000, your net realizable value is 10,300, and therefore your inventory must be valued at 10,300 because it's the lower of the two. Okay, nice and straightforward, start off with. And then part two, explain your answer to A. Okay, so it's basically just writing out what I've just said. So it would be something on the lines of under IAS2, inventory must be valued at the lower of cost or net realizable value. Net realizable value being the estimated selling price less any estimated costs of completion and or it can be either, it can be both any estimated costs to make the sale. Okay, so again, only two marks there, so we don't need to write loads. We're just explaining the calculations that we've done for part I. Okay, brilliant. So moving down, the directors of Dunstan PLC are preparing the company's financial statements for the year end of the 31st of December, and that's 20x1. On the 10th of January, 20x2, so that this would be after the year end, Dunstan PLC announced a plan to restructure the company at a cost of £5 million. Part B, I then, identify whether the announcement should be classified as an adjusting or non-adjusting event in Dunstan PLC's financial statements for the year end of the 31st of December, 20x1. Okay. Well, considering this happened after the year end and there was nothing to suggest that it should have happened before the year end or that it was going to happen before the year end, it would be classed as a non-adjusting event and that's under IAS 10, which is events after the reporting period. Okay, now it looks like we've got some continuations from this question. So part two states, state one reason for your answer to part B, I. So this is kind of what I've just said, explaining part I. So the announcement to restructure the business was made after the financial year end due to there being no evidence of this occurring prior to the year end, then under IAS 10, it would be classified as a non 
adjusting event. Okay, again, only one mark. So for all of these so far, we've had quite short explanations just because they've all been quite low mark questions. So we don't need to write loads. So the last part based on this stays state the accounted treatment of the announcement in Dunstan PLC's financial statements for the year end of the 31st of December. So there's no financial adjustments that need to be made. However, obviously it is a significant change to the business and we are now aware of it during the period in which we're preparing the financial statements and therefore it would need to be included in the notes to the account. It's just that no actual financial changes would need to be made to the financial statements. So all we would need to do is state this within the notes to the account. So we just want something on the lines of the restructure of the business with an estimated cost of 5 million should be included within the notes to the accounts. Brilliant. So that is covering IAS 10, which is events after the reporting period. And it's the ones where you're usually determining whether something is an adjusting or a non-adjusting event, just as we've looked at within this question. Okay, moving down then. The statement of financial position of Iconic Limited, a bed manufacturer, included an intangible asset of £900,000 at the 31st of December 20x0 in respect of the development of a new sleep sensor. The sleep sensor entered production on the 1st of October 20x1 and 600,000 sensors are expected to be sold before it is replaced with a more advanced product in three years time. In the year ended, the 31st of December 20x1, 30,000 sleep sensors were sold. Part C, calculate the amount of the amortization charge in respect of this development expenditure for the year ended the 31st of December 20x1 for two marks. Okay, so amortization is effectively depreciation for intangible assets. So it works in the same way. So effectively, this is depreciating or being amortized based upon the number of units that are being sold. So we've got an intangible asset of 900,000 and that will be amortized down to zero once all 600,000 sensors have been sold. So to calculate this, all we need to do, it's fairly straightforward, is take our intangible asset value of 900,000 and divide it by 600,000 sensors and that will give you the amortization value per sensor. All we need to do then is multiply the amortization per unit by the amount of units that were sold in December. So it would simply be 900,000 divided by 600,000 sensors multiplied by 30,000 sensors that were sold in December, which means we have an amortization charge in December of 45,000. Okay, fantastic. So moving on to the last question for task four then. So part D, identify whether each of the following costs should be included in the cost of an item of property, plant and equipment. So property, plant and equipment is covered under IAS 16, one that I think everyone remembers because it's one that you did at level three as well. So everyone kind of comes in and they already know IAS 2 and 16. It's just all the others that we've got to try and learn. So I think you've probably got a good idea on this one of what should and shouldn't be included. So anything which is a running cost would not be included. Anything that is capital, which is effectively the cost or anything to bring the item into a usable condition when it was first purchased or any enhancements going forward can be capitalized, but anything that's maintenance, repair work after the item was bought, then it would be classed as a running cost rather than capital expenditure. Okay, so how, let's have a look at each of these and decide whether they should be included within the cost or not included. So the first one, the cost of the maintenance contract would not be included. That is revenue expenditure. It is part of the running costs of that item and therefore couldn't be capitalized. We've then got professional fees incurred in relation to the item. 
So this will be classified as bringing the item into a usable condition. So without these, you wouldn't be able to use the item in the first place. So that could be something like surveyor's work or someone coming in to check that the item was in a usable condition due to legal reasons before it was actually put into use. So therefore that would be included in the cost that is required in order to get the item, like I said, into a usable position. And then the last one, installation costs, definitely would be included, because again, that would need to be done in order to be able to use the asset in the first place. Okay, so that does wrap up task four. So like I said, that was the second of three written questions. And just as a quick recap, like I said, in the beginning, this one will always be based on your international accounting standards. So it's only the ones that are in your books. It's not that you can be tested on absolutely any of them. It will just be the ones that you've learned about, which I guess for most of you is probably quite obvious, but it is something that I have been asked a few times in the past. So just want to confirm it's not any IAS and any IFRS. It is only the ones that are within your textbooks because they're the ones that we've been told about within the syllabus. Okay, so that does wrap up task four. So that does wrap up part two of this drafting and interpreting financial statements mock exam walkthrough. I hope you found it useful. And remember, if you did, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more AAT content. In part three of this walkthrough, I'll be covering task five on consolidated financial statements. That's good for watching. See you in part three.